I'd like to add a couple of notes here, more or less relating to the last video, the first video on polynomial rings. Um, just some comments on the way that we did things. Now, in the non-standard example that we did, when I did the multiplication, the f of x times the g of x, I did all of the multiplication first, just working inside of the real numbers, and then I did my reduction, modulo 5. I had another option. I could have constantly, as I went along, I could have always been working modulo 5, and I could have been reducing as I go. That's allowed. Um, and a perfectly valid method of doing things, and is often the easier method of doing things. Similarly, in the long division, I chose to reduce as I went along. So for instance, instead of putting that 3 halves as the coefficient on the x squared term at the very beginning of my computation, I chose to write that 3 halves as 4 immediately. One thing I could have done is I could have left it at 3 halves, and in the end, when I had written the polynomial as some member of uh, the polynomial ring, the rational numbers adjoined x uh, times g of x plus a remainder, I could have then gone through when that was all said and done, taken a look at those coefficients, and later converted them to z mod 5, and I would have arrived at the same answer. Now something that I'd like to point out is, in order to be able to perform this computation, I needed a couple of things. First of all, what I needed was for the polynomial f of x to have a degree that was larger than the degree of what I divided by, or equal to the degree of what I divided by, in order to be able to write it as q of x times g of x plus r of x. And the second thing that I needed that was significantly more important, I think, is I needed for the leading coefficient on g of x, the thing that I divided by, the divisor, I needed that to be a unit. I needed for that to be a unit in order to know that there always was something in the ring that I could multiply by in order to get whatever the coefficient was on f of x, no matter where I was in that computation. Um, I was fine in the previous example because I was working in z mod 5, which happens to be a field, and therefore anything that's non-zero is going to be a unit, and so I was fine whenever I had any polynomial. Uh, I believe that your book actually makes this a requirement. I think that your book says that we can do this division algorithm, we can do this quotient remainder process whenever we happen to be working in a field adjoined x as our polynomial ring. But that's a little bit stronger than what you actually need. And so to work out an example, I'd like you to take f of x and write it as q of x, g of x plus r of x when we work somewhere that is not a field. So the ring R is going to be z mod 6 adjoined x. My polynomials f and g are f is 2x cubed plus 4x squared plus x plus 1, and g is going to be 5x plus 3. So it doesn't matter that the coefficients on, many, on some of the terms in f don't happen to be units. That's not important. What's important is that the thing that I'm dividing by, that 5x plus 3, has a unit as its leading coefficient. That is, the 5, which is the coefficient on the x, happens to be a unit. And it's not even important that the 3, the constant term, is not a unit. The only thing that matters is that the coefficient on the x, that leading term, is a unit in z mod 6. And if you're really looking for a challenge or just to make yourself feel a little more comfortable with these non-standard examples, what I would say is maybe do this in two ways. First, do the long division and later on reduce, and then do the long division a second time and reduce as you go, and then verify your answers by seeing that you get the same thing no matter which route you took. Now let's move on. Let's move away from that non-standard example, and let's move on to studying some basic properties of polynomial rings. Now everything that I, hopefully everything that I have to say here will be a familiar topic to you. Um, however, that might not necessarily be the case, uh, but we're going to do everything abstractly, and it may have just been a while since you've seen these properties anyway, so you can think of this just as a little bit of a refresher. Now, even when the ring, even when the ring R in the polynomial ring, R adjoined X is different, and by different I just mean less standard, less familiar, so something like Z mod 5 or Z mod 6, or even worse than that in the example I'm going to give you next, 
we always do these multiplications in the same way. That is, we always add and multiply members of our adjoined x using the same distributive, taking the multiplication and distributing it over the addition techniques from more familiar polynomial rings. What I mean by that is this. Here's an exercise for you, which I'm not necessarily saying is the best exercise, but is a way to really wrap your mind about the weirdness of this, of how, just how weird the ring R can be. I would like you to perhaps compute what happens when you foil out the polynomial that I have here, where the coefficients happen to be matrices. That is, they're members of the ring GL2 of Z mod 7. So all of the numbers inside we're talking about, yeah, here I'll use it, the ground ring or the constants, so to speak, the coefficients that appear on the powers of x are members of the ring GL2 of Z mod 7. Again, that means that all of the numbers inside the matrices need to be numbers in the range of 0 through 6. And when you perform matrix computations, you want to reduce modulo 7. Um, and we're talking about 2 by 2 matrices here, and they have to have a non-zero determinant. So what I would say is a good exercise is to talk, take a look at this particular polynomial ring and do the standard foiling process that you're used to to see what you get when you foil out this ax plus b times this cx plus d. The next property of polynomial rings that I would like to write down is what I've been saying out loud in these videos is that suppose that we have f and g, these are two polynomials in the general polynomial ring r adjoined x, where r can be as weird as it wants to be, where the degree of f is greater than or equal to the degree of g, so f has the larger of the degrees of the two polynomials. If we happen to know that the leading coefficient of g is a unit, then we can always perform long division and use this division algorithm, or I use the phrase quotient remainder theorem interchangeably with division algorithm, to write the larger of the polynomials as a quotient times the smaller of the polynomials plus a remainder, where it is very important to note that the degree of the polynomial on the remainder will be strictly less than the degree of the polynomial g, the thing you're dividing by. Now the next property of polynomial rings that I want to stress is a somewhat important one, and this one we're going to justify by proving. But suppose that A, this is, and I should say that this is the one time we're going to actually talk about plugging values into a particular polynomial. We're going to talk about roots of polynomials. So an element is a root of a polynomial if when I plug it into the polynomial, it evaluates to, the polynomial evaluates to zero. So the fact that we have here that's very important is that the element A is a root of the polynomial f of, f of x if and only if the polynomial x minus a divides f of x. And what it means for that polynomial to divide f of x is to say that when I perform the division, when I take f of x and divide it by the polynomial g of x, which is x minus a, that the remainder term is just the number zero, the additive identity of the ground ring. Uh, note that we can do this division algorithm because the polynomial we're dividing by, which is x minus a, has a coefficient of 1 on the x, and that means that the coefficient is a unit, and the degree of x minus a is going to be less than or equal to the degree of f, as long as f is not just an arbitrary element of the ground ring. Now, let's do, let's walk through the proof of this equivalence. Let's first suppose that x minus a divides f of x. So what that means is that when I write f of x, according to this quotient remainder theorem, f of x is some polynomial q of x multiplied by the quantity x minus a, and there is no remainder term. That's what it means to say that x minus a divides f of x. What we want to show is that a is a root of f. That is, when we plug a into the polynomial f, this results in zero. So plugging a into f, this is the same as q of a times the quantity a minus a. 
a minus a is equal to the additive identity, which is zero. And when I multiply any element of any ring by the additive identity, this results in the additive identity. So stringing that all together, we've shown that when I plug a into the polynomial f, I get zero. Now, conversely, what we want to show now is we're going to assume that a is the element a is a root of the polynomial f, so that f of a is zero. And what we want to show is that x minus a divides the polynomial f. So we don't know that a priori, but we do know that we can use the division algorithm. So we can take f of x, and we can write it as q of x times the quantity x minus a plus r of x, remembering that this polynomial r of x has degree less than the degree of x minus a, and the degree of x minus a is 1. So that means that this polynomial, I've written it as r of x, but really this is just a sort of constant in the ground ring. So this is just some element of whatever the ground ring r or f is. So supposing that f of a is equal to 0, that's what we're assuming in this direction, then f of a is q of a plus the quantity a minus, q of a times the quantity a minus a plus r of a. Again, that q of a times the quantity a minus a is going to evaluate to 0. And what we have is that when I evaluate f at a, this is exactly equal to r of a. Okay. By the transitivity of equality, 0 is equal to this remainder, r of a. So r, when we evaluate it at a, is equal to 0. But r is just a polynomial of degree less than x minus a. So as I said, what this means is that r is just some sort of constant in the ground field, or ground ring, and what I've shown is that the constant it must be is the additive identity. So that tells us that r of x is a constant, this constant must be 0 since r evaluated at one particular element is 0, and this concludes the proof, showing us that x minus a divides f. Last of all the properties of polynomial rings are just a few, almost observations. But this is just something that should hopefully help you get an idea for how to think of R joined X. If you start with an arbitrary ring R and then look at the polynomial ring R joined X, this is containing an isomorphic copy of R. All of the things that don't have any X term in them are the isomorphic copy of R. And so what happens a lot of times is that the polynomial ring R joined X mimics many of the properties that R has. Um, this is not true of everything, but many of the properties that are true about R are also true about R adjoined X. For example, if the ring R was a ring that had zero divisors, then it's automatic that the ring R adjoined X has zero divisors. If the ring R has a unity, then so does the ring r adjoined x. And in fact, that unity is the same as the unity element from the ring r. And lastly, it happens to be the case that if r is an integral domain, uh, then r adjoined x is also an integral domain. So if you started with an integral domain and then you add on this element x, you can't somehow break that and automatically get zero divisors or automatically lose a unity or automatically uh, fail to be commutative. The next thing that we have up here which is important to note is that if you start with an integral domain and then all of a sudden uh, adjoin x to it and work in the ring d adjoin x, then a polynomial of degree n in d adjoin x has at most n zeros counting multiplicities and that's total in all worlds and all universes. And so we have this very nice, if you started with an integral domain, which is a really much better representation of the integers than an arbitrary ring is, then you get this nice fact that's true about integers inside this polynomial ring, which is this very familiar fact that a polynomial of degree n has at most n zeros.